Uh, well, I'm going to begin, Russell, by asking if directing was something that you've been considering for a long time, something that's been kind of brewing in your mind for quite a while. Yeah, a long time. And over, over a period of, you know, 20 years or whatever, I've directed about 30-something rock video clips and three full-length documentaries. So, um, yeah, it was, it's been in my mind for a long time. And, you know, the type of actor I am is that I'm always fundamentally concerned with where my character is in the story and how I can benefit the story by, by being accurate with where I am. Um, but I've also been, um, you know, I'm very focused on what the camera is doing because I don't believe in that old cliche that the, the camera either loves you or doesn't because that's bollocks, you know. Um, you know, and the more information you know about what the director's trying to achieve and how the camera is moving and what size the lens is and stuff, the more efficiently you can deliver that for the director and the quicker your day can go. So it's not that big a step from being an actor like that to then actually directing. Um, I mean, you know, that doesn't mean I didn't learn. I mean, you learn all the time. You know, I was in pre-production and I was crewing the film and it dawned on me that I'm not just crewing the film, I'm bringing together a collection of hearts and minds that you know I can extract the very best out of, whether it's an actor, whether it's a DP, whether it's a production designer, a costume designer, and that was thrilling, you know. So I was like, I was looking at all, uh, you know, my thinking about the films that I'd done, thinking about films that I loved, and in all of those key positions, I brought somebody into the film whose work I just love and respect, you know. And some of these relationships go back 25 years. My first AD, the first two lead roles I did in feature films. It was this guy, Chris Webb, was the first AD. And when I finished that second one, on the last day, after I finished my, my last shot, I said to him, um, you know, when I start directing, I'm going to need a man like, I'm going to need a, a man like you, you know? And he very laconically and dryly said, I shall be awaiting the call, <laughs> which didn't come for 25 years. Um, but, you know, that relationship we'd established on those films is still present in our relationship 25 years later. You know, Andrew Lesney, the DP who won an Oscar for Lord of the Rings, we did a couple of rock clips together. In fact, we shot four in one day once, um, four different songs. And, you know, at the beginning of the day, we were looking at each other going, this is an impossible task. At 4 a.m., we had a beer in, in hand, clinking, and said, that was a good day. <laughs> so we knew that we could, we had that thing, that energy together that just gelled, that worked, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the most magnificent medium film the most malleable, amazing medium. And to be the person that makes all of those choices, the colors, the composition, the framing, the movement, you know, what you want specifically out of the actors, I mean, it was just so fantastic, man, you know? I used to think I had the greatest job in the world, and then I discovered this, and that's, you know, it's just the bee's knees. Because I mean, you have, you have sort of made films since this. You've you've acted in, in movies. Mm -hmm. Have you approached them in a completely different way now you've directed? Have you, do, do you see everything now? Are you kind of sort of studying the way it all works in a different way to you ever did? The thing is, I always did. That was my point earlier. You know, there's a certain type of actor that is interested in the fundamentals of what what you're doing, and then and there's other blokes that just sit in their trailer and you know dribble out their dialogue when somebody says action. Um, yeah. So, but. Am I a little less patient? <laughs> Possibly. Because, you know, I know, you know, there's no excuses for having a slow day. You know, slow day is about people who are getting indulgent and not actually focusing on respecting the craft. You know, and one of the things that you have to be fully aware of when you're making a film is the cost. It's the most expensive commercial medium, artistic medium that exists. And, you know, as a director, you have you know, if you want to finance a movie these days, man, you have to be so very, very specific about where the nuts and bolts are and you've got to count every matchstick, you know. And you have a, a defined set of assets and a defined period of time. And once you stay go and you start on day one, it is a relentless task. And you must meet that ask with a, an equally relentless energy. So, yeah, I mean, the most deeply satisfying artistic experience I've ever had. Wow, and obviously we are sort of focusing a lot on the directing, but you're you're the lead star in this. It must have been quite a, an emotionally exhausting role for you, particularly as a parent. I mean, this is quite really puts you through the paces, at least, well, particularly for the audience, but never mind for for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's you know that's just one of those those things, and it's it's a funny thing because it never it never really bothered me until like you arrive on the set on a day and you realise oh I don't have to put on makeup today, 
I don't have to wear funny clothes. I can actually just sit and focus on, you know, what we're all doing. And, you know, in reality, they're the best days. So one of these days, I'll uh, hopefully get to make a film where my presence in the movie is not required in order to finance it, we'll see. I mean, this, box office-wise, this was the biggest film in Australia, 2014. Mm. I mean, there, there seems to be a, a new breed of filmmaker, of course, yourself and David Michaud, Julius mm. Avery, um, uh, uh, Justin Kurzel, of course. Yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, how important is it, do you think, for, for Australian filmmakers to remain in Australia and make movies to help boost the Australian film industry at the moment? Right now, it's very important. You know, uh, generationally, uh, in the 70s, we had this crop of, of directors who were so fundamentally inspirational in terms of how film has grown in Australia. And out of those guys, Fred Skepsi, Bruce Beresford, Peter Weir, Philip Noyce, Julian Armstrong, you know, you then uh, had a generation of, of cinematographers. Um, you know, John Seale, Russell Boyd, Andrew Lesney, and on and on and on. Um, and out of that, you then had a dominant generation of actors. Nicole Kidman, Kate Blanchett, Jeffrey Rush, myself, Hugh Jackman, Chris Hemsworth. And now it's important that the next generation of, of directors, so the whole thing, the cycle starts again, you know. And look, obviously we haven't talked production designers and costume designers, stuff like that, but Australia, in terms of world cinema, bats way above its weight. You know, there, if, if there's a major film going on, guaranteed somewhere in there is an Australian or a New Zealander, you know, in a, a key position. Um, so yeah, it's very important that, that it continues. You know, there was a, a strange sort of generational thing a little while ago where, you know, a couple of directors who shall remain nameless for this conversation um, said that we've run out of stories to tell. You know, and I remember reading that and just being, you know, fundamentally flawed that somebody could be so stupid, you know? Because me, I see a film in everybody. I see a film in you, I see a film in her. You know, that if you examine every single life, there will be tragedy, there will be joy, there will be loss, there will be euphoria. And that's what people want out of a film, you know? And even the simplest life is epic emotionally. And, you know, so I think, you know, it, this film is kind of like a, it's running a, a flag up, up the pole saying, you don't have to give in to a genre. You know, you don't have to pander in that way. It doesn't have to be killing tourists in the outback over and over again, even though that's fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, that we can get back to fundamentals. So here's a story about something that you thought you knew about from a completely different perspective. And, you know, I think hopefully that's going to be, you know, inspirational and encouraging to people to say, you know what, like, let's get back to like the key things, the things that made people love p films like Picnic and Hanging Rock, The Devil's Playground, Gallipoli back in the 70s and early 80s because if we are true culturally to the way we tell the story it's fascinating to other people so why don't we just do that instead of trying to pander and say well we can make a horror movie we can make a slasher film well you know instead of that which is easier to finance obviously um, the true cultural benefit is telling the story in a way that's culturally specific and if you want to make your second though team a movie about me. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely. I'll, I'll oblige. Sweet, mate. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Good. Cheers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey.